Hi, hello, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you're watching this, good morning. You might have guessed by the title, but today we're getting personal with some girl talk. If you're new to my channel, welcome. My name's Charlotte. See if you wanna hang out here for a little while, see if you like my videos. And if you're a returning viewer, welcome back, love you. I put up a story on my Instagram requesting questions, topics for discussion, themes, advice specifically for today's video under the guise of girl talk nothing's too tmi i'm in no way qualified to give anyone advice like really so take this all with a pinch of salt but i thought it'd be fun to sit have a chat go through all of this stuff i know everyone likes chatty videos from me i was gonna make this into a get ready with me but i actually find it really hard to do two things at once so i thought we'd just have concentration you and me talking discussing enjoying i actually got so many questions so we're going to split it up into a two-parter so you'll have this video today and then next wednesday you'll have part two i'm sorry about that i've put certain categories of questions into part one and part two just because it was easier for me to compartmentalize that way so in part one i'm going to answer your questions about anything physical and anything friendship by physical i mean we've got questions about hormonal contraception we've got questions about hair removal routines we've got questions about children about self-esteem so that's where we're going with part one and part Part two is going to be anything sex, love, relationship focused and career focused. Before I start this video, let me just do a little disclaimer because you know I love a disclaimer because God forbid I'd be misconstrued or misunderstood. I am in no position of authority to tell anyone what to do. I'm only giving advice and I'm trying to give sensible advice and I implore you all to do your own research on everything before taking the words of someone you don't know on the internet. Let my words today be a guide and another take and another opinion but don't let it be definitive words that you live by. Live by your own guidance and your own intuition and the support of the people around you. Thanks, let's get into it. Straight off the bat, my first question was about periods, which I love to see. Any experience with menstrual cups? If so, would you recommend? Not a very exciting answer, but it's no. But I've actually always wanted to try one. So really keen to hear other people's thoughts and feelings and experiences with them in the comments if you're comfortable sharing. I have been really meaning to get one for a long time. Um, I've got a couple of friends that use them and have really positive experiences with them. Two things, I have incredibly, incredibly, incredibly heavy periods. So it was like stressing me out a bit that I might have to change it quite frequently throughout the day. I do always carry a bottle of water with me anyway, so if I'm in a toilet cubicle with no sink, it's not really the end of the world. And also, I know you do have to sterilize them by boiling them, and I currently don't live like just me and my partner, so the thought of boiling my menstrual cup in a communal pot and pan, um, even though I know it's all sterile, but we live with my partner's parents. So it just like, the idea of it just makes me a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> I thought, oh, well I could buy like a separate pot. But then I was like, oh, I would have to like keep that to one side. And I know the thing like boiling water makes things sterile, but if you found out that you'd been like cooking your pasta in a pot that someone was sterilizing their menstrual cup in that you didn't know about, I think like on principle, you would be like a bit annoyed, wouldn't you? For anyone that doesn't know what a menstrual cup is, it's basically like a little silicone fold up cup um, in lieu of like a tampon and you can just like and the, it creates a vacuum seal and you can just leave it in all day and it's reusable obviously way more eco-friendly than like disposable sanitary options it's supposed to be a lot better for your body when you think that a lot of disposable sanitary products contain fragrance or are bleached um or have some kind of like chemical treating on them but yeah super convenient a lot less waste um it's definitely something i've been thinking about and been really wanting to try i don't have a lot to say on this because it's not been in like my realm of things that I've tried so let me know if you loved it and if it changed your life so the next question was um do I have any tips or advice on achieving hormonal balance through diet this is something I see a lot of people talking about online um I don't know if it's just because I'm in a lot of like wellness spaces online and the algorithm just knows where I'm at or if this is something that's maybe like gaining popularity and people are taking kind of their hormonal matters into their own hands through like diet, exercise, that kind of thing. But I see a lot of people discussing this specifically around PCOS. I've thought about this a lot and I've never specifically followed a diet catered to like getting my hormones back in tune and like hormone regulation only because I'm on hormonal contraception. So I don't know 
how beneficial this can be. I think obviously I can regulate my hormones to some degree, but I don't know if I can reap the full benefits of it from hormonal contraception because I'm on that. In terms of advice, I would say do research. And when I say do research, I mean do research beyond TikTok. While I think TikTok and social media is an amazing resource for starting out researching something, finding communities, um, especially people finding communities that are things that you're going through or things that you're looking into. I think it's very important to be mindful that like a lot of things work differently for a lot of people. You can find so many studies online and like research that's been conducted from like credible sources as well as like people with lived experience. Not that people with lived experience aren't credible sources, but I just think everyone's body is so different. So research, research, research and research thoroughly. Don't just like research social media, research articles, research reading, you know, you know what I'm trying to say. That being said, I try to consume like a low ultra processed foods diet around 75% of the time. Don't really like the term diet because it's not that I'm like dieting, that's just a way to describe what I'm eating. I don't actively diet. So yeah, I try to eat mainly whole foods where possible. I know it's not always really achievable. I live quite a slow paced life so that definitely helps. And I do think that since I've been doing that, that really has impacted my energy levels and how I feel around my period, especially with like bloating and how my stomach feels as well. I generally feel a lot more comfortable day to day um, since going for more of like a whole foods leaning diet. I'm not always very consistent with it and it's really hard and it can be really expensive, but I have noticed like quite a big difference in my energy levels um, once kind of like my initial cravings for things like Big Macs went out of the way. My main takeaway from that is do your research, um, do some reading, listen to audiobooks about it. There's obviously quite a few podcasts about it. Yeah, sorry, that's a lot of advice to someone that doesn't have an experience with that subject, but hopefully that's helped. I was laughing because you all really clocked me with the next set of questions. You all took one look at my colouring and my hair and my hair thickness and were like, she's got a bush, I'm gonna ask her shaving questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most questions I had out of all of them were questions about shaving. So shaving down there, sweating, best way to get rid of bikini line as a thick dark haired girl, like hair removal tips. Basically you wanna know tips and advice for how we're getting rid of our hair. I feel like people aren't gonna like my answer is that I hate shaving. I just like hate shaving. I've done it like quite a lot, but I just don't enjoy it. It's really stressful. I'm there usually for such a long time in the bath with like a hand mirror. I'm I am like so hairy. I just, I live a hairy existence. Honestly, I prefer waxing. And I know a lot of people are scared of waxing. It's really not that bad for me. Like the payoff of waxing is worth any kind of pain or uncomfortability for how long it takes me to shave and just the whole process of shaving, I fucking hate it. I shave my legs fine, I shave my underarms too. I did used to get the whole lot waxed, but this was like back in the day when it was cheap to get like your whole body waxed. So I got waxed for years. Like I've been getting waxed since I was like 21. Went through an off period of waxing and was shaving again. And I've only recently, like probably this year, just started picking up waxing again after not doing it for a long time and just shaving instead. And oh my God, there's no comparison to it. I had a course of laser and then I've had like one top up since and it's helped, but it's not the results that I thought I was gonna get. I think my laser clinic that I went to didn't really manage my expectations to be honest um, about what was achievable with my hair, my color, the amount of sessions that I'd booked, etc. It has helped how thickly my hair grows back and that's combined with years of waxing because my hair definitely grows back way more sparsely since I've been waxing for so long. If you're shaving only, get a good men's razor. But that being said, if you wanna shave, I would just recommend getting a wax if you can afford it. As someone that waxes, this, I, I like wanna have this little conversation about pubes because this is a conversation I have quite a lot, is that people don't wanna grow out. They don't wanna wait for the grow out period. It needs to be like a centimeter or two centimeters long before you can get another wax. I like to grow out a bit more between waxes, but that like a centimeter is like the minimum, but I wanna get the best wax I can get. So I'm, I'm waiting like four to six weeks. And when it grows back, it's not itchy. But if you're someone that doesn't wanna wax, because you don't want to wait for the grow out period because it makes you uncomfortable. I really just like urge you to get comfortable with your own pubes. Like I know that sounds really obvious but there's so many people that like shave so frequently because they don't like how they look or you know I don't know it's just like it's the most natural thing in the world. I just think get used to it. Challenge yourself, grow it out a little bit. So I can care less what I do in terms of landscaping down there and I I think if you're at a point where you really, really feel like you need 
to be hairless. I say this kindly and with the utmost respect, but I feel like you need to examine why you feel like you need that. I know that sounds really mean, but I think like if you need to be like that to feel sexy, the need is the bit that I'm focusing on here, right? Because everyone's allowed to do what they want with their body and have a preference. But if you feel like you need to be completely bald to be sexy, it's more than a preference. Like if you feel like you need something to be comfortable, it's more than just like an aesthetic preference at that point. Cause I have an aesthetic preference. I'm not gonna share that with everyone. Because it's more than just an aesthetic preference at that point, it's that you need it to feel a certain kind of way. Like your sexiness or your value or your cleanliness is directly linking with how that looks. Now let's have a think, like why is that? Is it because hair removal for people with vaginas is a societal expectation? Is it because that expectation is rooted in keeping women looking as young as they can forever. I just think like, let's get the cogs wearing. Ultimately, I know that that's none of my business whatsoever, what you do with yours and what I do with mine, the two are not related. But all I'm doing is urging women to make peace with their pubes. If they're gone, I will never know, but also like be happy if they're not gone, you know? Does that make sense? I could really just talk about that all day, but I fear it's too bold for this internet. We're still in the physical. Let's talk about skincare. So any skincare tips or products to get rid of scarring from spots slash acne. Actives, actives, actives. I don't suffer with any like textural scarring, so I don't have any like pocked or pitted skin, but I used to be and still am a little bit. I picked my skin a lot. So when I pick my skin, my scars go like really, really dark. I have at times struggled with like darker pigmentation. Like if I pop a spot, I've got a reminder of that spot on my face for like months. And with that, actives have helped me the most. I have got a video on skin picking, um, which I'll put in the bio and a little thumbnail on screen now about how I helped clear out my skin. It's a little bit of an older video now, but if that's something you struggle with, I would recommend watching that. So actives, and by actives, I mean anything that is like a chemical exfoliant that will help encourage uh, skin cell turnover, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. So AHAs, BHAs, retinols, tretinoin, salicylic acid, etc. Do your research, please. I'm not a skincare expert. I like really struggle to give skincare advice because I find it really hard to like create a skincare routine and I've only just found a decent one after like three years of trying. I would really recommend looking at Natalie O'Neill. Um, I'll pop a link to her channel in my bio. She's got a TikTok and a YouTube page and that's who I get like all of my skincare advice from. She's basically responsible for my skincare routine for like the last year or two. While my skin isn't perfect, it's definitely a lot better than it was two years ago. So I think what's really helped me is like researching people with similar skin types to me as well and seeing what they do and what they recommend. And then from there, like picking a product that's best suited to fade your marks, um, whatever those marks may be, if you want to. This will ultimately depend on like how severe your scarring is, but but that's what I'd recommend. I was gonna put this next question into the love and relationship section and actually I don't think it's relevant there because this is something you don't necessarily have to have any experience with love or relationships to consider and it is how to figure out if and when you want to have children. I understand that like for some of my viewers talking about like starting families or children or babies might be like a little bit triggering or you might be not in the right headspace to listen to that today. So either skip forward or just pick up with me next video. I'd rather that you just dip out on this rather than like persevere and be uncomfortable. So yeah, just so you bear that in mind, we're talking briefly about children. So how do you figure out if and when you want to have children? <laughs> when you find out, let me know. This is such a hard question. There's basically like two bits to this question, right? There's the if and then there's the when. For the if, I would say I'm still trying to figure this out myself to be honest. I like never really cared about children. Not like in a callous way, I just like, wasn't really fussed. I felt like I didn't really have a maternal bone in my body. I'm the youngest as well. So there's like no babies or children in my family. I don't really have close friends or haven't had in my life close friends with children and babies. That's obviously starting to change now. But like, I wasn't one of those girls that's like ever felt like she was destined to be a mother. Um, I also like don't have a mother. So I think that's like another layer of like feeling maternal that's like a bit different in my life. I wouldn't say like I have like a maternal instinct. And then I turned 26 and I felt this like biological 
drive that I was like, I really want a baby. And I was like, how dare you do the thing you are literally programmed to do and start making me think that I want kids. It felt like biologically it wasn't my decision. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I just like, is this hormone fog? Is this because I'm like with a partner I really love? I was like, I couldn't really like separate the two. I was like, is this just like my biological imperative urge to like reproduce? Or is this like a genuine change in the wind for me in terms of like how I feel about children? Basically, like if I see my man holding a baby, why am I like frothing at the mouth? you have to like chain me to a tree like a wolf under the full moon i don't know i'm still trying to figure that out but i also think there's like an element of like social programming to it like as i get older a lot of people are asking me like what my plans are to have kids which i think is fucking insane there's a lot of like long-term relationships and babies and like marriage and stuff happening around me and one thing that never surprises me is like people's audacity to ask like what your intentions are and don't get me wrong i know that's like quite a normal question to be like oh so what do you and xyz want to do you want to get married and it's like that for me i'm like quite a private person and i think it's a little bit of my neurodivergency i would much rather talk about anything else with someone i don't know that well because questions about my intentions with my partner our long-term plans um moving plans plans for my womb to me are like private discussions i would only talk about that with like my nearest and dearest so when someone comes up to me and is like oh do you think you'll have kids soon i'm like why do you ever think it's appropriate to ask that i know it's well-natured and i know it's not intentionally rude but that's how it feels to me. And when I try to answer in like a very blase way, you always look bothered. As a woman, you're always gonna look bothered. If someone asks you, would you like to get married? If I go, oh yeah, I'd absolutely love to get married. Like I really want to. And then people are like, oh, how long have you been together? And you're like, oh, seven years. They're like, you look like the woman that's desperate to get married. If someone asks you if you wanna get married and you're like, oh yeah, like I'm not really that fussed to be honest. Like what's the rush? You look like, too chill you look like annoyed that you've not got a ring yet i don't know it really this is something that really bothers me basically there's no right answer anyway back to the if thing there was a point to that it all circles back around i think one of the things that helped me is if you're deciding like if you want to have kids is to examine the reasons like why you want to have them or why you don't want to have them like literally a pros and cons list that will change as well like that will evolve like my if list probably wasn't the same as my if list is like in three years today or three years ago like if your reason for wanting to have children is because it's like the done thing the heteronormative thing because all of your peers are having babies or like you feel like it's the correct thing to do the next step in your relationship i'm not gonna lie i don't think that's a good enough reason that was a bit judgmental of me i mean that that's like not a good enough reason for me do you want kids because your parents want grandkids like is that something your parents are like desperate for and you are like not that fussed about also maybe not a good enough reason maybe you're saying you don't want kids because you've had some issues in your life that have led you to believe that you might not be a good parent but you actually, you really would like children, etc., etc. so on and so forth. Not to like expose my business after saying that I'm like super private about my intentions, but I would never want like an only child, but having more than one child, it's fucking expensive. And also I feel a bit weird about like the environmental impact of having children on like a dying planet. It feels weird to me. As for the when portion, I feel like there's never going to be a right time like you're probably never going to feel prepared to have children and I say this as someone that like doesn't have any kids so if I'm wrong fine I'm wrong if you are in a position where you might have the luxury to attempt to plan when you might like to have a child I think it's just like best to bear in mind that it is unlikely that things are gonna go to that plan you might say like oh i want to have kids by the time i'm 30 and then that doesn't work out just like don't beat yourself up about it i think if you're able to plan and you've decided to pick like a rough age or a rough year like great you know it's great to be prepared but i just think don't be so wedded to that like don't tie your sense of success and achievement to that time scale. I don't have a fucking clue because I'm like navigating all this myself and also don't have any children. So <laughs> 
that's my limited advice that I can give you. Next up, there was a few questions in the realm of like body image, weight, self-esteem, societal pressures on like saying a certain size, and I'm gonna tackle them all in the same kind of arena. Again, this might be a conversation that you don't wanna to listen to today or ever, so feel free to move on. I'm gonna read out the questions because there's three that are separate, but I think it's good to put them all together. So someone's asked for advice on the pressure to be a certain size slash constantly wanting to lose weight slash body image. You're always so positive when clothes are not fitting you at the moment. How can I be like that? And have you always been so body confident? I love your attitude about clothes not fitting you anymore, etc. First of all, thank you for all of your lovely comments. It's a conversation I've always been wary to have for a multitude of reasons. Obviously, I don't want to upset or trigger anyone just by like having this conversation in the first place. And also, I would hate for someone to misunderstand me or potentially just come across as insensitive. The main reason being that I'm very conscious that I speak from a place of privilege as a gal that moves through the world who is thin. I don't say that to be rude or inflammatory, but more so like an acknowledgement that there is a vast amount of experiences and perspectives out there and that I'm only giving this like quote unquote advice as someone that sees the world through like a lens of my own experience. I understand weight and body discussion can be triggering for people so that's why I did my earlier disclaimer. Now is the time to move on to another video or skip ahead if you don't want to be part of this discussion. I'm very conscious that everything so far in this video has sounded very like me 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 I I I but this is simply like how I got to this point. So to cut a long story short I've come to the conclusion that my soul and my essence of being and like who I am are not linked with my physical appearance. Like this is just a vessel kind of vibes. Now, I get that that doesn't sound quite right or might not sit right with some of you given that we live in a world where like seeing someone is the first way we like catalog them you know physical appearance people like judge a book by its cover physical appearance is the first thing we catalog about people and to not acknowledge that or to deny that is basically just a lie but to some extent my physical appearance is an expression and like an extension of who i am so how i dress my tattoos etc all that jazz that is an expression of like who i am but my body could drastically change overnight or by tomorrow and it wouldn't really change like who I am as a person. I would still be the same person inside. I wouldn't speak down to my friends or treat my friends any worse or any differently if that happened to them. So why wouldn't I extend that same grace to myself? My body and my weight and my appearance will fluctuate throughout the course of my life, especially as I grow old. And like, that's a privilege to be able to witness that, but also like a given, it's a natural thing that's gonna happen. I used to be like an absolute gym rat. And while aesthetics was a huge part of it, like how I looked, I always tried to hammer home to myself that actually strength and mobility is a huge part of why I was doing this. Like I want to be able to take a step up when I'm 80 and not, not have to live in like a bungalow because I'm unable to like lift up my foot to take a step. It's the same reason I do yoga now and Pilates, like I want good mobility, I want good strength. More recently, I have been on medication that's really, really caused my weight to fluctuate quite dramatically for me in a short space of time. Even though I feel like it's probably not immediately obvious to everyone else, it has like affected my appetite quite a lot and changed my relationship with food quite a lot. I have a really positive relationship with food. I'm very lucky. I think what felt like such a drastic change for me happening in such a short space of time did like affect me psychologically a bit. I got quite down about it. It was like a necessary medication for me. I didn't feel like there was much I could do about it. But like ultimately it's just like led me to the conclusion that sometimes my clothes are going to fit me and sometimes they're not. And that's that's okay, like that's fine. I'm at a point in my life where like, I believe this about myself and other people as well. And I hope that this is like a takeaway from the video for anyone that's worrying about this is that like, we all just have so much more to offer people than how we look. Like my physical appearance is like the least interesting thing about me. It is really, really hard work to undo like years of ingrained like thinking, societal pressure, like ideals about quote unquote ideal body types and like how we should move through the world and like how we should look and like what's healthy and all this like notion of like clean versus dirty food you know like I hate the term like clean eating like it makes me scream I think it's really hard to undo that especially 
like for people around my age because we grew up in like super size versus super skinny was on the tv like that's a show about eating disorders and that was just like on at 7 p.m i know this is like all a bit insane for me to say like especially as i do content creation which is literally like a career for the most part based on like people's first impressions of you and like looking at you and like consuming content about you and i do a lot of like get dressed with me content and a lot of makeup content and just stuff that's based in physical appearance this sounds a bit insane but like this what you're seeing is like not who i am like it's who i am but it's not who i am at my core at my core being it's not the person i am it's an expression of like who i am it was obviously like technically who i am like oh look she's over there i think that sounds a bit intense and i hope it comes across in the right way i also do what i like to call micro acts of feminism which is because some language is so ingrained in us right so if someone at work is talking about oh no i'm being good like if you let's say you like offer them a malteser or something and they're like oh no i'm being good and i'm like it's not bad to have a treat like you know just like breaking down that language or like this notion of like clean and dirty food so like clean eating what is clean eating why are we using that label just like nipping that kind of stuff in the bud like oh it's so naughty to have this and it's like is it naughty listening to like your body signals about something you want to eat that will make you feel happy and nourished we were like oh i've been so bad recently it's like okay have you been bad or are you just feeling like you need to instill some like dietary balance in what you're eating not that like everyone needs to be like oh yeah i'm trying to instill still more dietary balance in what I'm eating. I just like hate the language around like good, bad food, clean, dirty, like naughty. You know, like Weight Watchers is like, is it Weight Watchers? What's the other one? And they call it Sins. They call it Sins. I think it is Weight Watchers. Is it Weight Watchers? One of them's a point-based system and they call it Sins. And like, that's crazy. Like to call food a sin. Anyway, I just think start challenging your own mindset around stuff like that. Also stop following people on social media that make you feel bad about yourself. That's like a surefire recipe for disaster. You should feel encouraged, motivated. They should be aspirational to a point. But if you see something that makes you feel bad about yourself, unfollow i don't really think that answered anyone's questions but it's just kind of like my thought process and where i'm at with that i don't really feel like i should be giving advice to people about like how to deal with issues around weight and stuff when i've always kind of been like the same size more give or take like a few dress sizes either side you know it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like genuine it doesn't feel responsible it doesn't feel like correct so all i can do is give you advice on like how to manage your internal conversation around that like what that looks like with yourself what piece of advice would you give your 18 year old self i thought about this for a really 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 long time because i was trying to think about like where i was at when i was 18 how i was feeling like what my life was like i almost don't have any advice to give myself my little 18 year old self but it sounds so cliche but it's really that like time heals everything like that really just is it. That's like a bit of advice I'd give myself now. Oh, I felt a bit emotional saying that. Not me giving myself advice and nearly making myself cry. But yeah, as time heals everything, because like everything feels so big and so deep when you're that age, I think. And arguably now I have like bigger feelings than ever, but things really feel like monumental when you're 18. I felt so old when I was 18. Not old, but I think I just felt so like mature. I was like, I'm 18. And then sometimes I see someone at the pub and I'll be like, I don't think they can legally drink. And then it turns out they're like 20. So I just remember like, that's probably how young I looked. And that sounds really condescending, but that's not my intention. But that's probably how young I looked. And I really thought I knew it all. And that was 10 years ago and I still feel 18. Slightly different hair, slightly different makeup, slightly different outfit is in fact the next day. We are in the same video. We're continuing with that video, but I had to stop filming because I had an issue with my memory card. So we're back to answer the rest of the questions, but it is the next day. I feel like the next chunk of questions is quite juicy because it's all about friendships and... I love talking about friends. I love thinking about friends. I love thinking about friendship. Someone has asked for advice on friendships in your 20s and how hard it is to maintain friendships when it's one-sided. In my experience, this is just like such a difficult thing to go through, a difficult topic. There's no one-size-fits-all answer to this question. I think in our 20s, it's not uncommon that we lose friendships and relationships because of our changing priorities and priorities shift and lifestyles change. But that being said, I feel like we gain a lot more meaningful connection with the friendships that last through this period in our life. Generally, my advice on friendships is to really invest time and like nourish the friendships that make you feel really good, the friendships that fill up your cup, 
the ones that don't drain your energy, to really spend time putting into the friendships that you feel very drawn to. And also to remember, I think, that friendships are inherently an exchange of energy. As we get older, the stakes get higher, I think, and the process takes longer with friendships. So you're inevitably gonna need to support your friends through much larger life events, things that feel like really drastic shifts through traumatic events, through, yeah, life-changing events, basically. Stuff that feels a lot more serious and in turn, they're gonna be supporting you through this when the time comes, if the time comes. I think for me, true friendship is really about like reciprocity and knowing that I could fill up my friend's cup while she goes through something really, really intense and I'm always gonna get that back from her. It might not be for like another five years. I might not need to like call on her for that, but I'm patient waiting for that and knowing that. And that sounds very like tit for tat, like I only do stuff knowing that I'm gonna get back. But it's the same way as that I'll buy my mate a coffee and I don't expect her to send me the money because I know she'll probably get me a coffee. I don't know when we're gonna go for coffee. It might be in two months, it might be in a week. For me, it's that natural like give and take obviously that kind of reciprocity obviously that kind of emotional reciprocity can't be in place without a huge level of trust but for me that's what friendships are about and i see a lot of people who will support their friend through a breakup and then be like really pissed off three months later when they feel like it's all me 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 i i i from the friend and it's kind of like well that's a very individualistic way of thinking you are supporting your friend through something and the time will come when she has to support you through something. So I think people should be a bit more patient with that. I don't think we inherently befriend people with the kind of idea of like, oh, what can I get from this person like emotionally or otherwise? But I do think everything is an exchange. As for being one-sided and finding friendships hard to maintain because they're one-sided, I... I'm very much in a kind of headspace at the moment and probably have been for like the last year or so where if you are doing what you can to maintain a friendship and you're just not getting anything back as sad as it may be I just find I personally am a lot happier and it relieves pressure off the other person when I just give the same energy that people get back from me. Don't let that be your first reaction though. I think if someone is being very one-sided, maybe they're taking ages to get back to your messages, maybe they never follow through on plans with you, maybe they keep cancelling. I do actually think it's always a really good idea to come at it from a place of care and just check in with them because like someone might be having a really hard time and just like unable to reply to your messages and then it's up to you to decide whether you're pissed off at that but I think it's worth checking in. You know if I've ever had an instance where I've not heard from my friend for like three weeks and I've been a little bit like well if they don't message me I'm not going to message them. Almost every single time I felt really bad because they've been really going through something and felt unable to reach out to people or maybe they've not been in a headspace where they want to update people via text message. So I just think let's all be a bit nicer when it comes to stuff like that. Once that's been established that maybe they're just like not being a very good friend to you then you can maybe just return that energy you know. I think I'm a lot happier when I do that and I just think, okay, it's fine. I'm not gonna put all my energy into something that's really just not working out. It is a little bit sad when you realize you have to do that, but sometimes it's just a necessary step to keep you happy. If you're the only one out of the two of you that's like going to the trouble to maintain the friendship, it's really only gonna breed a sense of resentment or like unspoken feelings in you. I just feel like that the resentment damages you more than it does the other person. The next question is asking for tips on distancing yourself from a friendship that no longer serves you. I feel like this is a really hard thing to go through on both sides and I feel like there's a huge lack of acknowledgement in like day-to-day -day society that often friendship breakups are worse than regular breakups. There's no easy answer to this because there's no one size fits all because each friendship is so different. So I'm gonna kind of talk what I think I would do, maybe. I unfortunately am the type of person that would avoid confrontation with my friendships. With a romantic relationship, I'll speak my truth till the cows come home, but I don't wanna fight with my friends. I think if there's no arguments and you haven't been like quote unquote wronged, like there's no slight or damage that's been done to you. If it was me, 
I'm just like slipping out the back door slowly and quietly. I will do it as long as it needs to take. This is tough because I guess it depends on your level invo of involvement with the friend. If you're someone that you see each other every day, nearly, let's say you're like going to school together or college or work together, it's much harder to do this. If you're someone that's like cross country, long distance relationship with them, it's a lot easier. The reason I decided to do that, and don't get me wrong, I like literally haven't done that very often at all, but the reason I'll decide to do that is because I don't really wanna have an argument over like nothing. It's really hard to inform someone that you're not getting anything good out of this friendship without really, really hurting their feelings. I do think though, if this is a very long-standing, tenured friendship where you've been through a lot together, maybe you have a lot of overlapping social circles, maybe it's not like a clean break, this can be very, very difficult because I've been in situations where I feel like I owe the person an explanation. Not even from like a I owe it to them, but from the fact that if I put myself in the other person's shoes, I'd be devastated and I'd wanna know like what it was that went wrong. Especially if you've been through a lot together, I think it's like, it's nice, it's good practice. Just because something doesn't serve me anymore, it doesn't mean I don't want the best for that person and doesn't mean I wanna part on bad terms. Unfortunately, like the bad terms part is not always in your control, but it's basically just weighing up whether you wanna give them an explanation and make peace with the fact that they really might fucking hate you for that, or whether you just wanna go ghost and they also might really fucking hate you for that. Like I said, it really depends on what your situation is because if you're like this, there's almost always no clean way out. I don't know, I'd be really interested to hear other people's advice on that because that's really tough. I just, I've had like only a couple of friendship breakups in my life. I just think like where you can, always be polite, always be kind, always be gracious and always back out slowly if the situation allows for it. I don't know though, do you know what, like to put myself in the other person's shoes, if one of my friends like went ghost, I would probably be really upset about it. Like I would lay awake wondering what went wrong. So I feel like there's really no right answer. If they're mean or like they've wronged you, you can just go, I think. But if it's just kind of like you've outgrown each other or you feel like you've outgrown them, yeah, you have to do the Irish goodbye. I feel like that's not very like love and light of me at all, but I just, I'm really awkward with stuff like that. I wouldn't know how to deal with that myself. Top three red flags in female friendships. Number one, becoming friends too quickly. Close friends too quickly. Best friends too quickly. People who become your best friends overnight. I've done this before, I just get swept away. I love a new friend. It feels very lovely and love bomby and like, wow, I've got a new friend. I don't make a lot of new friends very often. So when I do, I'm like, wow, this is so exciting. A new friendship is like truly intoxicating, but I've noticed that friendships that are made very, very, very hard and fast, you know those like inseparable ones? You know them friendships that like, you become inseparable with the girls that are posting up Maddie and Cassie after knowing each other like a month. These friendships usually aren't very steady or stable and often, often have really, really bad breakups. Becoming best friends quickly is a feeling you can get hooked on. I think friendships are quite similar to romantic relationships in that friendships should be like a slow progression, a slow test of whether you're compatible with each other, getting to know each other slowly. The next one is jealousy slash competition slash one-upsmanship. This is so deep for me, like I really hate this shit. You know, when you just feel like someone is constantly competing with you, this can manifest in so many different ways, but like I can't stand someone who is like constantly in a silent competition with me, but I'm not supposed to know, they might not even know, like babe there is no competition and I don't mean it in that because I always win I mean that in a way that like we all win like there's no comparing because we just don't feel that need to like constantly compete with each other I cannot be friends with someone that never wants to be happy for me that wants me to stay at the same level that doesn't ever want to see me succeed that doesn't celebrate me I feel like some people really don't understand that like when I'm up we're all up when you're up we're all up 
being jealous is actually like so rotten like i think it makes people act absolutely insane now i will always be happy for someone doing well so it is like insane to me that people can't be happy for their friends <laughs> i feel like everyone's gonna have someone in mind you know those kinds of people that if you said like oh my god i'm so tired i only got five hours sleep tonight they'd be like oh we'll try to i've got it so much worse than you and it's like not everything needs to be like suffering olympics and to clarify that is very different from sharing your experience in a way to relate to someone because i do that a lot i'll be like oh my god yeah the other night i got like i only got four hours of sleep i felt terrible you must feel awful that's very different because it's about how it's said and it's about the tone it's all about the delivery isn't it those will be the first kinds of people that will be like oh well it was never my intention to sound like that and it's actually like it's not really about the intention is it it never is it's about the impact it has like i could say the most heinous shit ever but if i don't mean it to hurt anyone's feelings that doesn't matter what matters is it hurts someone's feelings and then the third one for me is talking negatively about people's appearances especially women and especially things out of people's control i'm not gonna lie and say that i'm perfect and that i've never made a comment about someone's appearance especially if i'm like really upset or really angry or just feeling like a bitch that day but that doesn't stop it being a red flag for me this has always been really weird to me and me and my friends who are like really close have always said this. I could not like someone, someone could piss me off, someone could do something like abhorrent. But if I'm going in on them, I'm only gonna ever go in on their character, who they are as a person, their values, their morals, their ethics. I'm never coming for their appearance. Appearance is not fair game to me. I, I just don't think it's very clever to insult someone's appearance. It's extra weird, extra, extra, extra weird when someone does it unprovoked. You know, if someone's just like walking past you in the street and someone was like, oh, that person's fucking fat. Like, why would you say that? Why do you care about how other people look? It really just like, it reeks of not being comfortable in your own skin, especially to come for someone you don't know or just something so out of someone else's control or just like really unnecessary. I just think we have better things to talk about. And I think for me where the red flag here lies is it's not abnormal to hear someone do that to come for someone's appearance i feel like a lot of people do it especially online especially in day-to-day -day conversation but it is the frequency of which they do it if someone is constantly constantly doing it I, then i think it's weird and it's a bit of a red flag i just don't ever really think it's necessary it's just not very smart is it like come up with an intelligent insult if you're going to insult someone you have to say something bad about someone say something about their character don't say something about their appearance like boring it really just does speak volumes about someone i think so that was all of the part one questions in part two we're going to be covering sex love and relationships career questions of which there aren't like a huge amount it's mainly sex love and relationships and i'll be covering like any miscellaneous questions i had a few like dribs and drabs about style i had a few wardrobe questions that i just want to pick up in there i hope you enjoyed today's video I would love if I haven't covered any of those questions adequately through lack of experience or just you had something to add to the conversation, pop it in the comments if you feel comfortable doing so. I'm sure there's a lot of you with a lot more experience in certain arenas than I've ever had. So yeah, it would be nice to help each other all out, I think. A two will hopefully be up next Wednesday. I upload Wednesdays and Sundays around 6 p.m. in the evening. I've put my socials links in the bio, so like my Instagram, my TikTok, you can follow me on those. Once again, sorry about the day change, but if you like today's video and you're not subscribed i would really appreciate it if you just hit the subscribe button and yeah i'll see you on the next video thank you so much for having a little bit of girly chat with me today mwah, mwah, mwah. goodbye <laughs>